Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Wild Digital. Um, you know what? I want to start off by thanking four people, so I want to get some housekeeping out of the way. There's a surprise visitor in the room that I didn't expect, and this was my very, very, very first angel investor 20 years ago. I want to thank my mother, who's sitting at the back of the room, now supremely embarrassed. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> so if anyone you see, anyone walk around the room who looks just like, you know, one or two years older than me and maybe looks like an older sister, that's my mother. Introduce yourself and say hi. So mom, thank you very much for coming here. Um, number two, I want to thank everyone in the room wearing a suit jacket. Put your hands up. Everyone wearing a suit jacket. These are the people with money. <laughs> I should take mine off. Um, I want to thank everyone in the room who's not wearing a jacket. Put your hands up. Everyone who's an entrepreneur working in a startup. This is everyone in the room looking for money. So if we put these two people together in the next two days, it'll be beautiful. Um, lastly, I want to thank a um, really, really big round of applause for the ladies who have put together this event. We put this event on. This is the second year. We don't do this to make money. We don't do this because we're in the event business. We do this because we passionately, passionately believe in growing the internet ecosystem in this region, and it's just great to put everyone in the room together for today. So big round of applause for Linda and Peggy and all of the girls from the team. <clears throat> if you see any of them while you're walking around, if you just give them a hug, give them a kiss, tell them thank you so much for putting on a great event, it'll be much, much appreciated. So what I want to start with is Last year, I gave a 20-minute presentation, and I thought I could summarize my entire last year presentation in one slide. So it's a bit like when you watch Game of Thrones, and the first 30 seconds is a recap. So what I thought I'd do is a very quick recap for you guys, which is, number one, Southeast Asia has 280 million smartphone users. Big, fancy number. Why is this really important? Because the region of the world that we live in is today now bigger than America in terms of smartphone users, is bigger than Europe in terms of smartphone users. And why that is really, really important is what that means is that if you build an internet business targeting these 200 million smartphone users, you have the potential to build a business bigger than these great American companies that you read about that are worth one billion, two billion, whatever, whatever. Because a lot of these American companies generally only focus on the domestic American market, which is about 210 smartphone users. So what I'm trying to say is that for the first time in my 20-year career as an internet entrepreneur, is a company created in Southeast Asia has the potential to be bigger than companies created in America. Number two, the emerging middle class. There's something like four to five million people moving from lower class to middle class in Southeast Asia every quarter. So what that means is that the entire population of Singapore, all of a sudden, every quarter, needs to find a place to live, needs to find a car, needs to find a job, needs to get a credit card. So what's incredible is that if you're building a business targeting the middle class in Southeast Asia with a smartphone, you have this massive, massive tailwind behind you whereby your target market just keeps growing by this phenomenal number every year, even without you doing anything. Now, thirdly, which is very important for companies like ourselves, this part of the world has 10% of global internet users. Yet, when you add up the valuations of all of the internet companies in this part of the world, it, we actually only represent less than 1% of global internet enterprise value. So what that means is that this part of the world is massively underrepresented in terms of great internet company value creation. So the way that we look at that, it means that there's a huge, huge opportunity to create very, very sizable companies because at the moment is we have more users than Europe. We have more users in America. We have a middle class that grows every year. The middle class is not growing in America. The middle class is not growing in Europe. In some cases, you could argue the middle class is actually decreasing. So we have this massive opportunity, yet for the moment, all of the creation, all of the enterprise value creation is not flowing into this part of the world. So I think if you're involved in the internet business, or you invest in internet businesses, or you want to invest in internet businesses here, 
It is a huge, huge opportunity. All right, that was the recap of my entire presentation from last year. <clears throat> so what I wanted to share with you today is actually talk a little bit more personal, rather than give you great statistics about the region, and I'm, a lot of the great speakers today will share that with you. I wanted to share with you a methodology that Catchy uses when we, uh, when we look at what kind of companies do we want to be involved in. And <clears throat> two things stood out in my mind as really shaping the way that we think about things. One was, if you were raised in this part of the world, as I was, if you look over the last 40 years, countries like Singapore and Malaysia have gone from being obscure third world countries to being serious, major, recognized global players. This is a photo of downtown KL 40 years ago. This is a photo of downtown KL last year. So if you've lived in this part of the world and seen this great transformation from third world to first world, or almost first world, you start to realize that really anything is possible. You know, if, if countries can massively transform and shift, why can't great transformational internet companies be created from this part of the world? But what I found very interesting, and I was in um, Silicon Valley last week with Mark, CEO of iFlix, and we were at Andreessen Horowitz, and there was a very interesting statistic that I found a little troublesome. <clears throat> it said, in Silicon Valley, 4,000 companies are funded a year, yet 15 of those companies take 85% of the value creation. So what is amazing is that you read every day on TechCrunch or the Wall Street Journal, this company raised 10 million, this company raised 20 million, blah, 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 blah. The odds are that 90% of those companies don't actually get anywhere with the money that they raise. And that 85% of the big value created just goes to 15 companies. So we spent a lot of time thinking, how do we make sure that something we're involved in is one of the 15 that creates as much value as possible? So what we've kind of come up with internally is a, it's kind of a methodology that we think about or we use when we build great disruptive businesses. And I made it very simple. I've distilled it to the five Ps to building a great disruptive business. Number one, we believe that the first thing that anyone needs to think about is you need to think about the problem that you're solving. A lot of people, and we see this, will come and go, here's my business plan, here's my great internet idea. I go, why are you doing this? The answer, journalist, because I think I can make a lot of money. And we always find that is the wrong approach. The approach is you've really got to find out what is the core problem that your business is trying to solve. And <clears throat> when you start with what is the problem as your first point of reference, then you're on the right path to creating a great business. If you look at, say, something like Google, what was the problem that Google, the search engine, solved? If you look at 10 years ago, if someone said, hey, Patrick, meet me for lunch at this restaurant in this other part of town, and can you call them up and make a booking? Pre-Google, how long would that have taken? Well, first, I've got to look up in the yellow, I've got to look up the restaurant's name, I've got to find it. There you go, five minutes. I've got to call them. Maybe they're not open yet, maybe they don't pick up the phone, so then maybe I've got to call back again five minutes later. And then when I eventually get the booking, I've got to look up in a map and see where they're located and how to get there. So it's probably 15 minutes of your life wasted trying to figure out how to get to a restaurant and make a booking. Today, or even say seven years ago with Google, you could have done that in one millisecond. You could have typed in the restaurant, you would have seen the name, you would have seen a link to a map, you would have seen the address, you would have seen opening hours, and in some part of the world you can actually book the restaurant straight away. So the initial fundamental premise of Google was solving a major, major problem. Google didn't set out from day one to build a $300 billion company. Google from day one said, there's so much information out there, let's make it available faster in an easily searchable format for people to find so that we can save time and we can make the world a more informed place. And as a result, they did solve that problem. Nobody uses the yellow pages or white pages anymore, and nobody uses physical maps to get anywhere. So when you start to think about the problem that Google solved, you start to realize that's why they are a $300 billion company. They solved a massive problem. A business that we were very, very fortunate to be involved with for the last nine years is a company called iProperty. And when we started this business, we said, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? I'll tell you what the problem was. It was Tuesday. I wanted to find a place to rent in KL. 
So what do, I, what do you have to do? If you think back 10 years ago, you bought Tuesday's newspaper, and you looked in the classifieds, but on Tuesdays, they don't have any listings. They just have the crap listings, so you, so you don't find anything. So then you have to wait until Saturday. You buy Saturday's newspaper. You look at the classifieds. There's no map. There's no photos. There's just three line listings. And then you've got to call everyone. And the typical thing when you call them is like, hi, I saw this apartment. I'd like to look at it. You say, okay, sure. Let's make an appointment to see it next week. So from start to finish, if you arrived in Kale on a Tuesday and wanted to find a place to live, it's probably a two, three week process. And so one of the things that we sought out to accomplish with our property was we said, there's this massive problem. It's an incredible, inefficient process to find a place to live. So today with iProperty, you can go on a Tuesday, you can find property straight away, you can see the photos, you can see the listings, you can see the maps, you can see the reviews, you can contact the agents. Should you want to physically view the place, you can probably get an appointment by Wednesday, because now agents are rated on how quickly they respond, and if you like the place, you could confirm and move in by Thursday. So what used to take two, three weeks, now takes 48 hours. So in the process, iProperty solved a massive problem to the point where in the last 10 years, we estimate probably 10 million people across the region have used our property to find a place to live. And when you think about that problem, we're pretty proud to say that across the region, everyone at some point over a four to five year period is either looking for a place to buy, sell, or rent. So in terms of what problem are we solving, we're, prob we're solving a big problem that touches many, many people, and as a result, it's a business that was recently sold for $750 million because we solved a big problem. So number one, start with a problem. Now here's an interesting thing. If you're looking to solve a problem, we're actually not that smart at Catcher. What we do is you can go online and you can type in unicorns and you'll see many tables that show you all of the companies globally that have already been independently verified and worth over a billion US dollars. Every single company on this list is solving a big problem. So you can study this list and think, which of these companies is solving a problem that I think I can do better in Southeast Asia or the Middle East or Latin America and so on and so forth. So it gets to the point where start with looking at what problem are you solving and then everything else falls into place. Number two, <clears throat> so you figure out, you find this big problem, you go, I want to solve this problem, I want to build a business around solving it, what do I need next? Number two is you need passion. And I think when you look at these two individuals, no one would ever describe them as saying, oh, Elon Musk has the best business plan, or Steve Jobs has the most amazing uh, spreadsheet or biz five-year business model. It's not even about that they are strongly, strongly passionate about solving big, big problems. Elon Musk is not worried about the business model. He's just strongly passionate about revolutionizing the car industry. Two weeks ago, he said he wants to find a way for SpaceX to land on Mars. Do you think he even has the business model figured out? Not at all. He's just deeply passionate about figuring that out. And same with Steve Jobs. So what do you find very interesting is that passion should always, always come first before business plan. So if you're looking for a business to start, find a problem, be really passionate about solving that problem. Or if you're looking to invest in a business, back an entrepreneur who's not doing it because he thinks it's gonna make a lot of money. You've got to back an entrepreneur who actually may not have figured out how it makes money, but is super deeply passionate about solving that fundamental problem. There's something that I wrote in, in a personal journal of mine several years ago. Um, when we were struggling startup, we were broke, we had no money, I was like, why are we working seven days a week? And I realized one of my rules would be, I would rather work seven days a week for nothing with people that I love and something that I'm passionate for instead of work five days a week for a lot of money with people that I don't love on something that I don't care about. So I realized that if you align yourself with the first statement, you'll align yourself with a great problem that you're passionate about solving. Thirdly, people. <laughs> this is not Jack Ma and his 17 girlfriends. This is a, <laughs> sorry, some of them are guys. 
This is, when you think of Alibaba, this is now a company worth about two to three hundred billion US, probably one of the most successful internet companies in the world. Everybody knows Jack Ma, but nobody knows anyone else in this photo. But if you actually go to the Alibaba corporate website and you click on founders of the company, it says that Alibaba was founded by 18 individuals in Huangzhou in 1998. And these are most of those individuals. It was really, really hard to find this photo. What, when it comes to the point was that people build great disruptive businesses, not individuals. You may know the name, you may know a face, but behind the scenes, there's awesome individuals who are all part of the journey in creating a great business. I don't, now, there's been three studies out there that have always resonated in my mind, and what they've said is that they surveyed a lot of VCs and said, would you inv rather invest in an A-grade team with a shitty business plan? So you know, they, they knew they wanted to do something, but they didn't know how they were going to make money. Or would you rather invest in a, a B-grade team, but the business plan was phenomenal? And they surveyed all the top VCs, and every single one of them said, I'd rather go with the first. I'd rather back an A-grade team with a shitty business plan. Because what they'd conclude is that if you're an A-grade team, you will, and you have the passion to fix the problem, you will eventually create an awesome business plan. If you have a B-grade team with an A-grade business plan, you'll fuck it up. So, so if there's those of you in the room who are saying, I'm an A-grade player, but I haven't figured out my business plan yet, don't worry, you have time to figure it out. You don't need to have the world's best plan or business model from day one. You just have to have the passion and the people to work together to figure it out. Number two, studies have consistently shown that co-founders perform, be businesses with co-founders perform, biz perform better than businesses with one founder. If there's any of you in the room who's a sole founder, don't stress, don't worry. There's also great businesses out there as well with sole founders. But what is consistently shown is that when there's more smart, passionate, dedicated people focused on solving the problem, there's better outcomes. <clears throat> Thirdly, and this is quite interesting, 90% of game-changing ideas, you know, when a business says, this is not working, we need to do this, or this person isn't working, we need to pivot them over here, or, or this product is not working, we need to change the price point or the distribution, 90% of great ideas don't happen during working hours. 90% of great ideas happen outside of working hours in a startup culture. So which means that <clears throat> next time you go and have drinks with your fellow co-founders, it's actually more important than having a board meeting in the room because that is the environment where great disruptive ideas come out of. <clears throat> so back to the situation with Alibaba is, I think Jack Ma intrinsically realized that if he started the company with a lot of passionate, dedicated people, they would eventually find a way to create a huge disruptive business. And that photo that I showed was actually the Alibaba apartment. They actually claimed that they all lived in this apartment for the first year of the business's founding. And that, that's probably where you had 18 people committed to building the greatest internet company in China. And these people probably spent 24 seven figuring out how do we do this. Number four, fourth P. And probably in my mind, the most important P of all, <clears throat> which is pivot. In my mind, CEO really means chief pivot officer. Because what does CEO really mean? It means chief executive officer. It just means you manage a bunch of executives. Well, when you're involved in a startup and you're building a great disruptive business, sometimes it's not about managing executives. It's about having the ability to experiment having the ability to test, having the ability to try again when something doesn't work but you don't know why, having the ability to take a chance. Should we paint the product red? Should we paint the product black? Should we have a matrix structure? Should we have a regional structure, a divisional structure? Should we launch tomorrow? Should we launch next week? Having the ability to step outside your comfort zone. Are we free? Are we premium? Are we paid? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Back to my point earlier, every successful startup never knew the answer to any of these questions on day one or even year one, or even year two. But as long as you put smart, passionate people in a room and give them the ability to test and try and learn and pivot, they will eventually figure it out. <clears throat> You'll notice this if you use any of the Google products and you see the little word beta, 
And you're now, you're now pretty much seeing the word beta on the majority of products that come out of Silicon Valley, even two, three years after they've been launched and have hundreds of millions of users, because it comes back to this mindset where they recognize that, you know what, we have the right or the decision or the ability to completely change everything about this product should we feel the need to. And it's this whole beta mindset that is what I mean by pivoting. The fact that whatever you're doing, don't accept it as gospel. Have the ability and the team and the passion to realize, if this doesn't work, I'm gonna try this. If this doesn't work, I'm gonna try something else. One of the largest companies today, Apple, and Steve Jobs was really good at it. Steve Jobs was obsessed with trying new things all the time. You know, the, if you look back at what was Apple 20 years ago, 90% of their revenue came from the product in the te uh, top left corner, Apple 2E or 2C. If you look to today, Apple has pivoted their product range so much so that smartphones now represent greater than 50% of Apple's revenue and more than 70% of Apple's profit. So Apple's not even a computer company anymore. Apple's more of a phone company because Steve Jobs had the ability to keep pivoting and testing and trying and launching. And, and, that was his, and because he was so obsessed with keep trying to push the edge and launch the next product, Apple is now worth five, six, seven hundred billion. Whereas if Apple had just stayed and said, you know what, let's just be the best niche provider of specialized computers, the company would probably be bust now. <clears throat> so this is an interesting slide for me because there's a little story about Catcher. So Catcher started in 1999. Um, and that's when my mother so gladly decided to be our first angel investor. And I'm gonna be completely upfront with you. For the first eight years, we completely effed up every single business model that we tried. Every product failed. We launched a search engine in Southeast Asia in 1999. Um, before Google even launched, we had paid ads on the search engine, didn't work, nobody was interested. We launched a free SMS service. Users loved it, but it was bankrupting us day by day. Um, we had a dating service. I'm proud to say there's probably about 50 people in Southeast Asia who are today married because they met on catchadate.com. I'm not one of them. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the list of things that we tried and failed and effed up is tremendous. And, but what is really interesting is that we, we learned so much. We started to become really firm as to what works and what doesn't work. You know, so we realized that we've got to figure out what problem it is that we're going to try. We, we've got to stop saying, oh, that's really cool, let's try that. No, start with the problem first. Then we realized, hey, that guy's not doing anything. You know, we don't really think he's working out. We want to fire, you know what, let's let him try Project X. No, that isn't going to work either. You've got to, you've got to put really passionate people who are rock stars on solving great problems. <clears throat> so what was interesting is that we started in 1999, and, and 2007 was the first year that we actually had any success, and that was the year that I probably voted on the Australian Stock Exchange. So we basically had eight years of just pivot after pivot after pivot after pivot, and none of them worked. But you know what? We just kept trying, and it, it was really the last P that really kept us going, which is perseverance. We just knew that we wanted to build a great disruptive business. We didn't know how, we didn't know when, we actually didn't even know why, we just knew that we wanted to do something great. And Steve Jobs has consistently said that he believes what creates the big disruptive internet companies in Silicon Valley versus the other 95% that get funded and never go anywhere is purely perseverance. Next time you go to KFC, remember this story. If you've ever wondered why, why as you go to KFC, there's a, little, there's a statue of a really old looking white guy. Why? Because when Colonel Sanders finally founded KFC, he was about 70 years old. You go, why? Turns out that he invented the recipe for the crispy chicken when he was about 40 years old, but it took him 30 years to finally say, hey, I will give this weird, crazy, old white guy money to build a chicken business called Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he just kept persevering and persevering and saying, hey, I have a great chicken recipe. Will you fund my restaurant? No. Hey, I have a great chicken recipe. Will you fund my restaurant? No. And it was finally when he looked like that, he looked like me when he started the business. 
And he looked like that when he finally raised funding. And that's why you see that image in KFC everywhere in the world, because of perseverance. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, so we've been really, really fortunate to have been one of the founding partners of a company called iProperty, started in 2007. Um, we recently sold the company for 750 million Australian dollars. That company would not have existed without Perseverance. I'll tell you why. The first time someone finally agreed to invest in iProperty, it was very small, it was an amount of about $2 million. The first time someone agreed to invest in that company was after 74 meetings where everyone else had said no. We had met everyone that we could think of in Southeast Asia. At this time, by the way, there were no VCs in Southeast Asia. So there was high net worths, rich friends or uncles and so on. Will you invest in my property? No. Okay, meeting five, will you invest in my property? No. Meeting 10, will you invest in my property? No. And you know what? We were so naive that anyone else who is sane would have given up after 10 no's, but we kept going, meeting 20, will you invest? No. Meeting 30, no. It was finally meeting 75, and there's a gentleman in this room who was with me at meeting 75, when we finally found that first investor who said, yes, I'll give you the money you need to start this business. So when I really sometimes feel like, how did I probably become such a great business? It's because we'd never let the word no get in the way of building this great business. <clears throat> so what was interesting is that then someone said, oh, it must be easy for you guys now. It must be so easy to raise money. Well, you know what? So I started thinking about it, and I was on a plane um, from San Francisco with Mark Britt from iFlix, who's going to present after me. I said to Mark, I said, let's count together how many meetings that you, myself, and Luke did to raise the first round of funding for iFlix. And mind you, it was very courageous. iFlix raised 30 million US as an angel round. So no product, no team. I think Mark worked out of a shared desk at the Katja office no customers, but we very ambitiously said, if we want to build this business, we need 30 million US dollars from day one. You know what? It was 150 no's before finally someone said, you know what? You don't have a product, you don't have a team, you don't have an office, but I believe you guys, I'm going to invest in this business. And that was exactly how iFlix raised 30 million US dollars as an angel round. So lastly, um, <clears throat> find a big, beautiful problem that you are really, really deeply passionate to solve. You have something that resonates with you in some way, shape, or form. Put together a team of awesome, amazing rock stars who want to solve that problem with you and just keep pivoting and pivoting and pivoting until it works. And you know what? If none of that works, keep having the perseverance to try again until you eventually figure out. And every time someone says no, just keep pushing ahead until it eventually fucking works. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good